it's really nice to analyze why something didn't work in the screenplay format and why we have deleted scenes. It's a really educational process for me and humbling to kind of go back and say, wow, we spent all this money and all this time and love, and it didn't end up in the movie. Why? There was something about the structure of the movie that I didn't see or I didn't honor enough. So it's a really great process for me to learn, you know, becoming a better filmmaker, uh, a more efficacious filmmaker uh, in the process. The dream is like you don't cut out anything or very, very little. Um, the first cut of Glass was three hours and 20 minutes. So we lost over an hour of material. And I think it's because this was the first and only time, maybe in my career, ever that I will have written a sequel. And the normal process of writing is I'm figuring out who the characters are. And they, it's very economical because I'm, I'm just learning them and then I go, okay, that's what he or she said. In this case, I knew all the characters as soon as I put the pen down. So I was just overwriting essentially. And so I could write more than I needed to. I, that's what I, how I explain why there's so many extra scenes in, in the film. Maybe there's other reasons structurally because I was combining two movies and coming to a conclusion and it's a very complicated structure. But the end result is we had a lot of scenes that aren't in the movie that I really, really loved and I wanted to put a few of them on the Blu-ray. This scene that you're gonna see really hurt me not to put in the movie. And when I make movies, I'm making kind of slice of life, I don't want to say independent movies, but I, that's the way I feel about it, and commercial movies, which are kind of plot driven. And my tastes are a little bit more to slice of life indie than uh, the general combination I think can handle. And this scene would be an example of my feeling of like, I just want to live in the kind of, what is life like for these characters? And so this is a really cool, cool scene of David Dunn at the bar. And it's a beautiful little scene, it's funny, but under the pressure of a thriller, it's hard to do a, a scene this long just for character. Hey, Dad. I'm checking the police scanners. They're looking for you pretty aggressively. Be real careful. All right. Philadelphia has a new tallest building. The Osaka Tower is taking over the city skyline. The architecture makes it an amazing sight to see. And on top of that, it's the ultimate in sustainability. It gets its power from solar panels. Developers say it will draw jobs. This scene with Patricia that you're going to see, which there is a, a, a truncated version of that at the opening of the movie, used to be a much larger scene. And there's this really funny interaction with Patricia and the girls, but she's now a pro at abducting uh, teenage girls now. And so they've kind of skipped all of the kind of introductions, and she's really funny. And what's really interesting is this scene never could play in the movie um, as you're about to see it. And I think it's because... We already knew this information from Split, and in some way, Unbreakable, Split, and Glass are one movie, and it needed a really shorthand version of it. So then the movie is, hey, my name's Patricia, and you pretty much are out after that, whereas this is the full scene. I don't know what we're doing anymore. <sighs> we keep bringing him sacred food, and nothing's happening. I how can you speak in this manner? I, the, the beast, he's shown himself twice to the masses of the broken, and, and they're not believing. There's no revolution. I, Dennis, it takes time. Look at all of us. Our horde is now 11 from three. 11 enlightened souls inside Kevin. The rest of the world will believe with us. I, we're all fighting. Those of us that don't believe, they're bringing Kevin closer to the light. He can even hear now. I... Dennis, do not be scared. You have to trust me, as you always have. 
I was right before, wasn't I? The beast can do the things I said he can. Now I'm going to get upset if you carry on like this. You've done very well bringing him his sacred food. you all. My name is Patricia. Now I know it's been almost a day since we brought you here, but I find it's better to let you settle in before we greet you. It tempers all the unpleasant and unnecessary pleading and begging and plotting to escape. Also, the extra time allows for a certain sense of gravitas, don't you think? I do hope Dennis has been treating you well. Sweet potato. I tuck those long legs God gave you out of sight. Dennis is, how shall I say it, a tortured soul. Girls with legs like ours can't be too careful, can we? Now, Who'd like a PB and J sandwich? So this was uh, a, a, a beautiful little scene where Bruce is kind of sitting in his um, new chamber at the hospital, and the orderly comes in, and they just have a silent staring match where Pierce is trying to kind of silently say, I'm, I'm in charge here, and Bruce kind of looks over his shoulder like, I, I could kill you in, with, with my pinky. And, and they both stare at each other, and, and Pierce is kind of unraveled a little bit because he's heard a lot about, you know, they've all seen videos of this guy. He's really, really strong, so he's kind of like, hey, I'm in this place, I'm in charge. And it's just a beautiful little scene. The reason it's not in is just literally a rhythm thing of how long can we spend the, on the first night at the hospital. That was the only reason it's not in. It's actually one I'm really sad is not in the movie. One of my favorite characters to write is Casey, and um, she just came out really cleanly when I wrote Glass, and there was a whole area of the movie that I wanted to spend time, which is how has her life changed since Split? And again, because of the pressure of the thriller, of the structure of Glass, it doesn't allow that much uh, room for character development for any one of the many characters in the film. They have to be kind of tethered to the plot. So I, this scene that you're going to see is her in art class. And what I was trying to do in this scene is juxtapose the way I introduced her in Split. So in Split, she's invisible, doesn't want to be looked at. And here, she's totally OK with everybody looking at her, standing up in front of everyone. You can see her scars. And she's like, what's up? Any other questions? Why the boy? It's about dark and light. You need both for anything to feel real. Are there any questions about my painting? OK, 
Casey, could I see you for a second? I received a call from your foster family. This scene you're going to see is basically from Pierce's point of view of Dr. Staple explaining the machine. There's a few reasons for this scene that I, when I was writing it. One was to create a little bit of a false villain out of Pierce and, and getting you to sympathize with Dr. Staple. Also to give, give you a sense that there's been a history of her doing this to other people. So there's a reference to a guy in Italy. Um, and, you, and to really fixate on this machine as kind of a lobotomy machine. There's many threats in that, in that scene. Um, and it ended up coming out because, again, if you spend a little too much time with a side character, the movie bucks it. And we were just a hair too, too much with Pierce, and, and it didn't service the thriller. Think of your family members in here. How would you want them to be treated? We must dispel the notion that we are doing something bad to them. The radiation generator is here. Stay left of this when operating. Here is an MRI of a man in Italy I treated with this machine. Here is his MRI before and after. Look at the difference in his frontal lobe. He's a mechanic now, married with three children. This is just a little moment when we introduce Mrs. Price. I really love it. It's my kind of, uh, you know, homage to Spielberg, or I don't know why I kept calling the Spielberg shot. I mean, I'm sure he knows, but it's, in some way I'm stealing from something he did. But uh, we used to always call the Spielberg shot, Spielberg shot. So, you know, we introduce her kind of enigmatically, Mrs. Price, and then her hand, this kind of old lady hand comes up, and um, it's a kind of a beautiful way to introduce a character you haven't seen in, in 19 years. Mrs. Price? I try to come once every week. Sometimes I admit I have neglected a week here and there. He's changed over the years. I can tell he's given up. It's hard to see. He thinks he was a mistake. And I'm not saying he did good things. He didn't. Those poor people didn't deserve to die like that. But he's trying to make sense of who he is. And we all doing that. So this is another really sad loss. As you can see, I'm, 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 you know, kind of mourning the loss of all these little babies, you know, from the movie. And this one, again, is a slice of life thing. It's just Mrs. Price doing one monologue to her son and telling her about life and his life and what it's like, like at home. And it's sweet and endearing and funny and, um, uh, again, the only reason I had to pull it is because of the pressure of the of the thriller will allow only so much character development, which is you know the the the, the Faustian bargain you make once you do genre. Hi, baby. How you been? I've been good. A little pain in my knee, but that's to be expected. I changed the curtains in your room. They got stripes. Purple. <laughs> you always loved that color. <laughs> so, 114. You remember, that's the, uh, the apartment that shares our wall. Well, now, they have these six young ladies there. 
and they had a get together this weekend. Elijah, the ladies wore t-shirts with the word squad on it. Is, is that now some young person's term? I don't even know. You don't let them get you down, Elijah. You hear me? Stay proud. All right, so this is a really cool, eerie scene that was in the movie for a long time. And it actually, there's a little bit character, which is this, uh, one of the patients, in my mind, can see the true things in life. And she's been put in a mental, mental institution because no one believes her. And, I, and she's just one of these patients, and so she can tell when people are real, like, oh, wow, you're really a superhero, or you're really the beast, or this. And she can tell um, what you really are. So when she looks at, at Dr. Staple across the thing, she's laughing and goes, I know who you are, I know who you are. And Dr. Staple's kind of, you know, unnerved by this. And it's kind of an eerie kind of supernatural moment. And this lady actually come, used to come back in the movie uh, later. But we, we ended up cutting it out because it is kind of enigmatic. And it's kind of talking about a, a, a world that glass is set in that might be a hair confusing for people if I give everyone kind of prescient powers or something like that. So it, it came out, but it was a really weird and cool scene, and so here it is. Mr. Dunn, um, his camera's down. So I had multiple beats of Pierce being, you know, messed with by Elijah. So some he hears a noise, he goes out, sees a trash can knocked over, and somebody did this. Who did this? How did this trash can fall over? And he goes, huh, is it that dude again? I have my suspicion about Elijah. It goes, goes over into the room, and Elijah's just sitting in the room. So I had an extra beat of this, uh, in addition to the ones that you see in the movie, just to show that someone's messing with Pierce, and also to create a sense of haunted house feeling in this, in this hospital. And in the end, the reason it came out is because I didn't want you to be too far ahead of him, meaning Elijah, that he's actually getting out of his room. So that was the major reason I pulled it out, so that you are one-to-one -one as he's fighting his way out of the room. So this scene is a really cool scene, and one of Sam's favorite scenes in the scripts. It's really sad that it's not in there. It's a really complicated scene in its implications, and it's why it's not in the movie. Basically, Elijah signals to his mom that he's fully awake and that he's actually pretending to be medicated. He kind of gives a signal that I'm just pretending, Mom. 
And the, 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 the really interesting part of the scene is her reaction to this. And it implies that she's proud of him and wants him to break out and wants him to do what he needs to do to be the best version of himself. And that's very complicated because he's actually a murderer. And so implicating her in his nefarious ways was a tricky, tricky thing to do uh, for the audience. And so sadly, I had to take out this kind of delicious moment between the two of them. Baby, they're gonna do this procedure on you in three days. They say it's gonna make things better. I don't know how I feel about it, but I guess that's the way it's gonna be. Doctor seems like a... <laughs> Doctor seems like a nice person. You take care of yourself before they do this procedure in three days. Hmm? Three days go real fast. Not a lot of time to do things before. So this was a, a, a little scene that was supposed to intend to be showed how much David's starting to doubt and how much he doesn't like this burden of his power. So it's a very complicated thing again, this idea of would you be okay knowing everyone sins? And part of him's like, I wish I could just be normal. You know, I, I want to just be a regular guy. I want to spend time with my son. I, I don't want to know what you did wrong. And so this is a kind of a complicated scene because she's giving him a way out and saying, if you just let me put you in this machine, you can go home. And more than anything, he just wants to be with his son. I mean, it feels, he feels the loss of his wife, and he just doesn't want this life anymore, meaning the superhero life. So it's a really interesting, quiet scene. We conducted the procedure on Elijah Price this morning. He's resting now. Is he OK? Oh, you surprised me, David with your empathy. I'm happy with his progress. He'll be sluggish for a day and he'll brighten up tomorrow. If I had this procedure, I could leave and be with my son? Why do you ask, David? I give. All this can be explained away. We would have to go before a hearing board, but yes, I believe you would be able to leave. It's best for the family that I forget about all this. Let's talk about this thoroughly tomorrow. So this scene is basically the culmination of the laughing lady scene. And also, it's supposed to be, you know, really the beast I saw has an evangelist. And, and his flock are the broken. And so he doesn't look at the patients as less than. He looks at them as rise up kind of thing. And when they see him, they see a god. They see the version of him that uh, Kevin Wendell Crumb sees and all the, all the, the personality sees. He, they see the, the you know, the seven foot you know, creature that's half man, half beast, and that's bigger than life. So they're, they're astonished when they see him. They see his energy. And so this is a kind of an evangelist scene, which was so weird and cool. And when we shot it, we were thinking, this is going to be amazing. And actually, they, they use this shot a lot in the ads, which, you know, is always dicey, something that isn't in the movie. But it was meant to show kind of him in his glory, you know, kind of blessing everyone like, a, like an evangelist.